All right, uh, we shall get started. Welcome to this uh, policy webinar on the UHC day of 2020. We will be focusing on the healthcare realities of the urban poor with a big survey on rickshaw pullers, findings on that being presented. I welcome our chief guest, Dr. Shamsul Alam, our guest of honor, Tomo Huzumi, our uh, guest from Chatham House, Robert Yates, and our distinguished panel, and all those who have joined this interesting conversation. I would start by requesting everyone that uh, in the interest of an efficient webinar, we will keep ourselves muted. Host will ensure that. And those who will be asked to speak, their uh, microphone will be unmuted. We'll start off now. And I also see that Maya Vandenant has managed to join. Uh, welcome, Maya. So I will now ask AMM Nasiruddin, former health secretary and senior fellow PPRC, to do welcome remarks and initial context setting. Five minutes for you, Nasiruddin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Can you listen to me? Can you can you? Uh, listen? You are not audible. Can you, can you can you listen? Uh, technical team, please look at this issue. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Can you listen? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. Doctor Hussain Jalil Rahman. No, uh, Nasiruddin, we are not hearing you. Oh. Can anyone can hear, hear him? You any, can. Any Is problem? Audible to everyone? Can yes. You? Okay, then go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Hussain Jillu Rahman, Executive Chairman, PPRC, and uh, ses Sessions Chairman of today's webinar. Dr. Shamsul Alam, Senior Secretary and Member, GED Planning Commission, Bangladesh. And probably we will have uh, Tomo Huzumi. A representative of UNICEF Bangladesh as our guest of honor. I think he has not as yet joined. Yes, he, he has already joined. He has oh, yeah, already. yeah, yeah. Then, then okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, then the, the distinguished uh, panelists, Philip Gain, Executive Director, Society for Environment and Human Development, Rob Yates, Executive Director, Center for Universal Health, Chatham House, London, distinguished panel discussants and participants. Today, as Dr. Hussain Zillur Rahman has already pointed out, this webinar has been organized by PPRC to actually release the findings on, on, on uh, surveys conducted by PPRC with support from uh, UNICEF. Actually, uh, we are all aware that the COVID-19 has wrought a havoc throughout the globe. And, and, and the deficiencies and the shortcomings of our health system in Bangladesh has been un unfolded. And the COVID-19 had also its implications for uh, urban uh, primary health care of the poor, poor ne rather a negative impact. It had a, a lot of impact and also implications for our urban health care realities. PPRC has conducted a, a large scale survey on the shareholders the, uh, the, the largest, probably the one of the very ubiquitous uh, urban poor group on, on their health realities. And also the health realities of a few other urban uh, poor groups like truck drivers and also the sex workers, municipal cleaners, gypsies, etc., have also been uh, carried out. And uh, this webinar actually uh, has actually been organized to release the findings of those survey and the findings of the survey actually have brought forth a compelling uh, agenda for uh, urban uh, healthcare, urban primary healthcare for the poor uh, under the changed circumstances and as a priority of the uh, USC uh, in, in the USC prioritization. And we have to probably rethink uh, in totality about, uh, about our uh, primary health care uh, of the urban poor. We, we all know that historically, the urban primary health care for the poor uh, 
uh, has been uh, debated and discussed uh, as a very critical issue. Uh, and we have not probably been able to make an dent into the resolution of the, of the problem. And this study has, a, has unfolded that the situation, the realities are even, even worse than before. Uh, for, uh, so far as it relates to the healthcare of the urban, urban poor. We, we have today a distinguished panel of discussions. And we, we have Dr. Muhammad Shahadat Hussain Mahmoud, DZ, Director General Health Economics Unit. We have Professor MFOS, former Director General um, Health, Director General Health, Bangladesh. We have with us Dr. Uh, Mr. Abdul Hakim Majumdar, Project Director of uh, Universal uh, uh, Urban Primary Health Care Service Delivery Project. Uh, we have Tahmina Banu, the Director of Chitrang Research Institute for Child Health, Child Surgery. We have Professor Abdul Hamid, in, uh, of Professor of Institute of Health Economics, Dhaka University. And we also have Mr. Mushtaq Raza Chaudhary, convener, uh, Health, Health Watch. So a very, very distinguished uh, panel we have today to, and, um, to, uh, to participate. And we also have many other participants who are also experts in their uh, respective fields uh, who are already connected online. And actually, we believe that there will be a very uh, fruitful discussion today on the findings that will be released by the presenters. Uh, and uh, we are really looking forward to a very insightful discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, M.M. Nasiruddin. I will now ask Maya Vendenant of uh, Chief of Health of UNICEF Bangladesh to give her introductory remarks. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, sir. Uh, um, distinguished panelists and honorable guests today in this webinar um, support this and um, I don't want to take a lot of time. I think a lot of our um, uh, guests have, have, have a lot to say today. Um, urban health is really a very critical area and we have seen it in the uh, COVID crisis, how much more, um, uh, uh, how many issues there are and how much we really need to look into it in depth and uh, looking at what can be done in terms of urban health. And um, we, I want also to uh, acknowledge uh, the Swedish Embassy and uh, the Swedish International Development Agency whose generous support uh, supports this project for us. And um, uh, it's really very critical that we can work in partnership with all these partners around um, today. Um, we see that urban immunization has, has really gone down in the urban areas and often that is a precursor of others, other primary healthcare services and also showing the gaps. So um, it's really important to look into that. Uh, on top of that, there is a very high out-of-pocket expenditure in the country, um, which uh, really impedes a lot of people going in uh, to seek care. And we know that many, uh, many, many people uh, may face catastrophic health expenditure if they face this out-of-pocket uh, expenditure when they seek care. So um, this is why uh, we wanted to work uh, with the partners and PPRC has done this study around uh, the health seeking behavior in, in cer certain groups like the rickshaw poolers and others um, as, as, the, um, as the previous uh, speaker just uh, told us. So we really look forward to hearing from this and, um, uh, and from the different panelists to see what we can support uh, the government of Bangladesh in, uh, in advancing this agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Maya. Uh, so we'll start with the presentation. We'll request the technical team to put up the uh, presentation on the screen. And I will request all participants, if you'd like to make comments, observations, or questions, please do use the chat box. Our team will be monitoring that. And we will uh, also take note of your comments. 
uh, will now share the screen on the presentation. Just uh, as a background, PPRC undertook a large scale survey of the one of the largest groups of the urban poor, which is the rickshaw pullers. Uh, we have also done, uh, we are finishing a smaller survey on garment workers, and we have done qualitative studies on some other urban poor, such as truck drivers and a number of socially excluded urban poor groups, like the municipal cleaners, sex workers, and gypsies. So, but now I will start off with the presenting the finding of the rickshaw puller survey, which is the larger uh, empirical work that we have done. Next slide, please. And I should appreciate and acknowledge uh, my team members from PPRC, who have really helped to put together, uh, undertook the survey and, and ensured these findings but before sharing the findings of the survey per se, since on 12th, day before yesterday was the UHC day, I think it's useful to take a slight stock taking at the outset. And I have noted five systemic barriers for Bangladesh on the road to UHC. And these are statistics drawn from the WHO 2020 World Health Statistics. And, a small, uh, and uh, another PPRC survey carried out earlier this year. Five barriers. Number one is low service coverage of health services, 48%. There is major gaps in the workforce. I've just highlighted one of them, which is the density of you know, supportive health work of, workforce, nurse, my midwife. Per 10,000, it's only 4.1 compared to the global norm of 37.1. So you can see the gap there. High health-related financial hardships. This uh, is a very important concern in the context of Bangladesh and the statistics are really dramatic. If we use one a lower threshold of 10% of household income being uh, consumed in health expenditures, then it's 40.8 million in Bangladesh actually are having to undertake this hardship. That's about 24.7% of the population. If we take a slightly higher threshold of 25% of the household income being consumed in health related expenses, then it's 9.5% of the population or 15.7 million. So high health related financial hardship is a key concern. Poor public health, only 55% of population have access to safely managed drinking water. Before we used to use the indicator just access to drinking water and that was over 90%. But after SDG, we now use this indicator, which is safely managed, meaning the water is also safe. And then the dramatic difference we can see is the 55% is the access at this moment. 35% have access to hand washing facility with soap and water. These are uh, not from the survey itself. These are uh, WHO statistics for the country as a whole. Nutrition gap is a critical another barrier. Under five child stunting, we have improved a little, but still it's nearly 31%. But more critically, the nutrition gap is in the low diet diversity of the poor. And we find that 68% of poor have no meat in their weekly diet and 80% have no milk in their weekly diet. We'll see more on this in the rickshaw puller survey itself. Now, Pen, you know, this is the pandemic time still. So what has been the pandemic period learning as a starting point for our presentation? One is that systemic vulnerabilities of the health system have proved to be doubly acute for the urban poor. There have been disruptions in services, etc., and they, they have really impacted more on the urban poor, particularly private sector healthcare dried up. Uh, which was also one of the sources that urban poor had to go to in the absence of adequate public 
health uh, services. It is also very important that urban poor is not one homogeneous whole. There are spatial and occupational differentiation. And it's important to capture those differences to determine meaningful solution pathways. The third learning is that Bangladesh, in fact, WHO also has characterized Bangladesh as a country characterized by low service coverage on the one hand and high health related financial hardships on the other. So this means that urgent reform of service delivery models and health financing strategies is absolutely necessary. However, policy appetite and engagement for credible reform space uh, appears to be relatively low, which means that strong and innovative policy advocacy efforts may be important. And today's webinar is an attempt to really underscore the urgency of attending to this issue. Next, please. All right, now let's come to the survey itself. Uh, quickly, I'll go, I will not make time, much time. We carried out the survey in October, 2020. It was a more of a representative sample for Dhaka city as a whole of the 129 wards of Dhaka, Greater Dhaka, we chose 60 wards from Dhaka North, Dhaka South and the new wards. And in each, each ward, uh, five purposely selected spots and in each spot four rickshaw pullers randomly chosen. In total, we have 1,200 the survey size distributed among these three segments, Dhaka North, Dhaka South and the new wards. And we looked at, you know, both obviously the health care related information, but also to set the context, looked at their profile, living environment and the pandemic experience in terms of livelihoods and employment. Next, please. I think it's a useful question to ask at the very outset. Who are the rickshaw pullers? There are certain imageries in our minds when you think of these rickshaw pullers. So it's good to get some empirical facts on the ground about this segment of the urban poor. Next. Where do they come from? There was a time when we used to think they mostly come from only, the, it was a push sort of a factor, meaning people from very, uh, say, river uh, erosion areas, etc., crowded in here. But as you can see, uh, eco-vulnerable regions, yes, it's still the very important segment, 31.81% of the sample actually came from those districts. Uh, but a quarter, about 25% came from proximate districts, meaning it's also uh, is seen as an economic opportunity. Uh, rickshaw pulling as an economic opportunity is coming from you know, neighboring districts of Dhaka city. 19.717% uh, came from the Monga belt, which is the Northern poverty pockets. They used to be also an important source of this rickshaw pulling population. And the, there's a remainder, which is the 23 point, that's coming from all over, no particular uh, explanation there. If you look at, they're mostly, you know, uh, Obviously, on the education human capital angle, they are relatively on the lower side. Uh, it's illiterate, little knowledge, and primary up to you know up to perhaps grade nine se secondary cycle constitutes the majority of the population. So it's uh, it's not wholly illiterate, but uh, low human capital. That's a clear message here. Next. All right. So, in where do they live? They live in, you know, relatively. Uh, uh, there, there is a variety here. You know, there is a variation, of course. Even uh, one fifth actually live in some sort of pakka type of dwelling. Fifth half in semi pakka and kacha in twenty eight. So they are obviously, you know, in that sense, vulnerable, but not necessarily, uh, you know, all of them are extremely vulnerable in this particular indicator. Sources of drinking water, 76% actually piped water from Wasa. Of course, the question of uh, quality of water remains a very 
important issue. But I think what I will urge you to look at is this other in, uh, figure of 12.08 on self-arranged piped water. These are, you know, uh, newer approaches being done in the slum areas of how to reach water to these segments. The toilets, uh, as you can see, there is uh, sanitary toilets. And I think in the urban context, the toilets themselves may have improved, but the bigger problem in urban context here, of course, is the fecal sludge management, which is beyond the household per se. Next. How about their economic status? This, of course, drives home that they are very much a part of the urban poor. Per capita, per day income, you know, when this survey was done, it uh, translates into Taka 136 per capita per day. 7% uh, have second source of income and 56% have an additional earner in the family. But the income figure I'm showing is the, you know, average for all these sources taken together. Among the rickshaw pullers, actually about a fifth, 21.75% also own their rickshaw. So there is a variation within this group also. And interestingly, the percentage in the new wards, you know, outside, on the outskirts of the core Dhaka, which have been added now to Dhaka, the percentage of owner dry, uh, rickshaw pullers are higher, actually one third, 33%. And as you can see, uh, where do they make their expenses? Household expenditure, 56% on food, 28% on rent and utilities, 4% on healthcare, and 4.8% on education. 53% uh, are indebted, and they have to take these loans for consumption purposes, repaying earlier loan, and for medical costs. So I think the the poverty burden is uh, rather clear here. Next. This is also a question I would like to you to think over. There is a there may there is a perception that rickshaw pullers are, you know, they are temporary transient urban resident. That's the question I wanted to ask. Are rickshaw puller temporary urban residents, because if they're temporary, you don't need to think about their healthcare too much. But as you can see, on average, the respondents have been pulling rickshaw in Dhaka for 10.6 years. Around the year, 93%, this is their occupation for 93%. And during lockdown also, they uh, when they could work, they did continue in the same occupation. 62% continued during the lockdown. And now almost all of them have resumed rickshaw pulling post lockdown, which means that rickshaw pulling is a stable occupation. And there are categories of people who take this as an occupation over time, 10 years, 11 years nearly, they have been pulling rickshaw in Dhaka city. And you can also see that they are 87% uh, of them actually live in city with their whole family. Though 13% actually, of course, have part of their family in the villages, but the whole family resides here in Dhaka, 87%. And uh, we saw that 55% have no financial linkage in the sense of sending remittance. So they are life actually revolves in the city itself. So that's an important question, an answer we have found, that rickshaw pullers are not temporary urban residents. They are very much part of the urban landscape, and we have to look for their service needs appropriately. Next, please. Briefly on the pandemic impact on this group, because uh, since we are doing the survey, we had a look at this. Next, please. Uh, there was, of course, as everyone knows, during the lockdown, there was a uh, drop in food security, severe drop. Uh, but now, uh, the, in terms of the number of meals taken daily, on that indicator, uh, it's now more or less back to pre-COVID level for this group of the urban poor. 
not necessarily for all groups of the urban poor. But the key issue is nutritional gap. As you can see in their weekly diet, and this is not just a pandemic impact issue. This is the general nutritional insecurity that in their weekly diet, no meat, no egg, and no milk at all in the weekly diet. You can see the percentages, you know, 70% uh, no meat, 12% no egg, 26% no milk. And if we add to this that, okay, if you just took once a week and or didn't take at all, if we combine those two, the figures jump to 80% on meat, 77.5% uh, on egg and uh, sorry, on, uh, on milk and 37.4% on egg. So nutritional insecurity is a very, very critical concern for the urban poor. And I think there's a grow growing recognition that this is the next frontier on our food security efforts. Next, please. Uh, in terms of employment, 38% unemployment during the lockdown period, but post lockdown activity recovery is near universal. During lockdown, 50% drop in income, but post lockdown, it's 81.6% uh, at of pre COVID level. Interestingly, there is virtually no reporting of COVID infection among this group, only 0.1% reported a infection by uh, COVID-19. That's a, uh, I think there has been also talk that among this particular categories, there has been a, the infection spread has been uh, remarkably absent. This seems to support that idea. Next, please. Okay, now let's come to our uh, key focus, which is on the healthcare realities. Next. Okay. 61% uh, you know, reported some illness in the family last three months. The male and female, similar type of, except that for female, there is some additional anemia is, was also noted. 8% suffer from chronic diseases and that adds to the high health related expenditure because that requires constant medication. 0.42% suffer from disabilities. Some of the habits are also interesting to note here that uh, Rikshapula as a group seems to be heavy smokers. 72.5% are smokers. 62% are reliant on daily street food. But on the hygiene part, that's not a too bad a situation. 60% wash hands with soap before eating and 84% wash hand with soap after toilet. Next. But uh, that was the health status. Now let's look at access to health care, particularly let's look at access to institutional urban primary health care in terms of health cards. Only 9% actually of the survey group have this, uh, uh, have this institutional urban primary health care access. And uh, much of it is, of course, from the three groups, you know, the city corporation, NGO, government organization, the 9% the who do have it, they are basically uh, either from the urban primary health care project or from, you know, some uh, government entity or from some NGOs on their own. But the more Interesting figure here is the 9%, meaning 91% actually do not have uh, any access to this uh, uh, organized institutional urban primary health care. Next. And interestingly also, the health cards cover only a limited range of services, essentially child and maternal health. Child health too about you know the immunization, family planning, NCPNC and SRHF services. These were the main uh, main. Uh, so it is 
what we know note is that institutionally organized urban primary health care is characterized by both very low coverage of population and low coverage of services next health seeking on the general health care you know where do they find their uh, this is all well known is the pharmacy uh, interestingly the female try to access more uh, you know the more serious healthcare facilities like the public health care private even private doctors chambers and the ngo uphc sdp that's interesting observation here and where do they get the advice for these is from themselves neighbor local pharmacy or local doctor so we looked at the access in terms of three seg segments one was the general healthcare one was child healthcare and one was maternal healthcare so this is the picture on the general healthcare pharmacy being the dominant one the other one you know public healthcare facilities also playing an important role more for the female uh, uh, for the females than the males so do the private facilities it would tend to indicate that uh, there is perhaps a greater attention to the uh, needs of the female members within these families. Next, this is the child health care. And as I mentioned, child health care, we essentially looked at these four dimensions of health care. One was vaccination, deworming, vitamin A capsule, and birth registration. Vaccination, you know, this is not just the COVID period. This is, you know, whether there were any child in the family was vaccinated, that answer. It does seem that they have vaccinated for the, at least this rickshaw group, though, as Maya indicated, uh, the urban slums as a whole, there is a growing drop in the rate of immunization. Uh, you can also have a look at the source of services. Where was this services? Attained again, interestingly, the uh, it's mostly temporary. You know, the government campaign on these, the NGO are there also. Interestingly, eighteen percent went to their villages for these services. That's a interesting. Uh, so, a segment of this urban poor are also accessing their healthcare needs not in the city, but for these they may be going to the villages. And we also thought that distance is an important issue. And we have some figures on the, and we can see that it's not actually very near, not necessarily just next door. You may have to travel a little to get a little or a, more than little for accessing this service. And there was a dis disruption during COVID-19. Uh, I think 27% definitely said there was a disruption and 44.5% mentioned that they didn't know about this. Dewarming again, uh, there is a lower uh, figure of 73% who have really accessed this. And again, similar type of sources, similar type of distance and discontinuation. Next, please. Vitamin A capsule, 85% you know, received, similar to uh, the other in terms of services, uh, source of services, distance, and discontinuation. Let's look a bit more on the birth registration. 78% mentioned that they have registered their birth. But interestingly, the for this, they have mostly gone back to the villages to do this. 63% actually the source is the Union Purishad or the Union Subcenter. And the urban ward counselor's office or services provided is the remaining 34%. Next, maternal health care. So we looked at five types of maternal health care services, family planning, ANC, PNC, uh, and delivery. Family planning, 68.8% mentioned that they have been receiving this. Interestingly, the family planning source is uh, pharmacy, again, dominant here, the U NGO UPSC, CSDP is 23. 
Again, village also figures here. Uh, similarly, distance and there was a discontinuation also was mentioned. ANC much lower, 58.5% mentioned this. And again, here, the NGO UPHC SDP seems to be the most important source. Public facilities, other public facilities are important. Also, private facilities are also availed here. Again, village figures here. Next. Delivery, 59.1%, uh, you know, they received some services. Here again, also the NGO UPAC SDP are an important source of service, public facilities, private, and again, village as also, and there was a discontinuation also was mentioned during COVID-19. PNC is even lower, 44.2%. Similar again on the source of services, and also again mention of disruption of services. Next. All right, now let's look at the, from the standpoint of the beneficiaries, meaning the surveyed respondents, what are their healthcare priorities and what are their preferences? And I think they mentioned clearly four priorities. Lower financial hardship was the top priority for them, 49.8%. Behavioral issues also figured very prominently. Doctor behavior, 32 point, nearly one third mentioned this. Of course, availability of doctor was also mentioned by 11% and proximity of facility, the need for that was also mentioned by 7%. I think it's also in the urban context, it's a very important issue about this visiting our preference because often governments have uh, facilities are open during the day and closed during the time when the urban poor may be trying to access their health needs. So as you can see, their prefer preference for visiting our morning is just a fifth, 21.4%, noon is four, 5%. Evening is the highest, 52%, even at night, 21% would like to this gives a big signal about how we do organize the delivery of these services. Currently, government services tend to close around two and therefore may be missing out uh, the big chunk of the, uh, the urban poor. Next. We wanted to uh, do a closing uh, question on these rickshaw pullers, as I mentioned, they are here. They are part of the urban resident. What are their aspirations? So as you can see, their immediate, the highest, the most important aspiration for them is simply to be able to continue this occupation and remain solvent. 60% mentioned this. That's their key first top uh, aspiration, which is like they're not being very too much ambitious here just to be able to continue this. Education of children has been prioritized even by this very group, 47% prioritized this. But there are also ambitions at play here. 43% would like to start their own business. 35% would like to buy a land in the village. 35% would like to build a house in the village. That's a you know, the rural route to some extent still remains in a way, though they are fully integrated within the urban economy. Jobs for children, 23%. And some of them would also like to become owner of rickshaw. So that's like almost like a career path in some sense. 21% would like to be owner. Good healthcare was mentioned by 19 and a foreign job by a much smaller person, 4.3, which is a very great difference from the rural context. Much of our external migrant workers actually go from the rural context. As you can see here, the urban poor, among them, it's just a, not a very dominant aspiration. Next, please. So I want to just quickly close this uh, presentation by a few key messages. We'll obviously have the uh, panel discuss all the policy implications issue. Next. So I think one thing I would like to, I think which has come through very clearly that urban poor are not temporary visitors. 
but are integral component of the urban economy. That is a very important issue. And I think here we have just presented the figures, uh, the findings on the rickshaw puller survey. We have not, uh, uh, we're not, we're not presenting today a smaller qualitative surveys on the uh, truck drivers, but we'll do a bit, uh, some on the socially excluded groups. Second, I think key message, we found that more than the pandemic impact, their concern is improvement in their systemic economic and service opportunities is the larger concern of the urban poor. Certainly pandemic is there as a concern, but they are you know, in a certain uh, existential realities and improvement of those are their main concern. And therefore, urban primary healthcare has to be seen not as a budgetary burden, but as a highly productive investment because it needs, uh, it improves the productivity of this important group of the urban poor. Next. And it is also important to re uh, uh, keep in mind the segmentation within the urban poor. And I think we, from our surveys, we find that it is useful to segment these two broad segments as a starting point to think about. One is this economic groups type, you know, rickshaw pullers, truck drivers, and then there's the socially excluded groups who beyond their economic problems, they find they have additional problems. You know, the municipal cleaners, sex workers and by bede or gypsies, they actually also face double burden of trying to access their healthcare needs. So, and it is, we'll see later that uh, the, uh, whether these groups, to what extent these are uh, in a way organized groups who have platforms which can be used or whether they do not, uh, they, even if they have platforms, they are not really usable. Like the truck drivers, the FGDs that we have done in Dhaka city was very clear that they have associations of owners and workers, but they have actually play very, almost no role in the provision of their healthcare. But on the other hand, the, uh, the social excluded groups may have that opportunity. Urban health solutions must address four critical client concerns. I mentioned this already, lower OOP burden, doctor behavior availability and facilities in the neighborhood. I think this is also an important issue. Final key message here, as you saw, you know, as I, at the very outset, I mentioned that the ground realities suggest that Bangladesh is in a situation, a country of low service coverage and high financial hardship, and which calls for urgent service delivery and financing reforms. But uh, there appears to be low policy appetite for urgent health sector reforms. Perhaps the urgency of this is not yet, you know, given the competing economic sectoral priorities, it has not been perhaps gone through sufficiently. So I think the last message I to give here is that a big push on policy advocacy by civic group is urgently necessary. And I'm very happy that Dr. Shamsul Alam is our chief guest today. He is the custodian of preparing the eight five year plan. Those are important policy windows for this, but the big push, in fact, uh, we are also considering a, a big push on this front uh, sometime next month uh, on the civic groups to in a way to address the low policy appetite and try and generate more policy interest. So I will end the presentation on the rickshaw puller survey here and ask my colleague, Philip Gain to briefly mention the situation of the socially excluded groups. Philip Gain, over to you. Philip. Is Philip here? All right, if Philip is not here, then I will request our friend from London, 
Mr. Robert Yates, Executive Director of the Center for Universal Health Chatham House. Uh, floor is yours on the financing challenges for UHC. Robert Yates. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Hussain. I, I can see that Philip Gain is actually on the call, so, so I, I don't know. Um, maybe he's just sort of temporarily stepped away. So if at any if at any point he suddenly reappears, I'm quite happy to. No, uh, you, to you, can, you can finish your, and then you know, then he can be brought in once you're finished. Okay, okay. Well, th 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 thank you very much indeed, and I'm absolutely delighted to to join you in celebration of UHC Day, of course, which was on which was on Saturday, and and um, lovely to be with such a, a de dedicated uh, group of people uh, championing universal health coverage in uh, in Bangladesh. Um, might I be able to share my screen as well? I, I'm just uh, assume, assuming that I have that. Uh, I think the host may be. Uh, has to uh, enable me to, to share my... We'll request the technical team to enable Robert Yates to share his screen. Great, and that, that seems to have come up there. So so, so uh, I'm pretty sure this is the, the correct presentation. One always has the problems with so many presentations open. Um, so uh, just confirming that... that uh, uh, you can see my screen there, my slides. Yes, we can. Brilliant. Th thank you very much indeed. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, I'd just like to maybe sort of take the discussion um, up, um, you know, to, to the macro situation as yeah. regards health financing for universal health coverage, which of course is extremely uh, relevant for the discussion about how um, urban populations and the urban poor access health services and also uh, for the rest of the population as well. And um, just remind uh, colleagues about the definition of universal health coverage, that it's all people receive the quality health services they need without suffering financial hardship. And really emphasize the point that there's no reference here to insurance. People often think that health insurance and universal health coverage are synonymous. They're not, you know, you, you don't necessarily need explicit health insurance to take you to UHC. It's all about everyone getting the health services they need with financial protection. And we, we saw in a very eloquent uh, presentation there that, that um, a good a number of um, poor people, particularly rickshaw pullers, aren't accessing the health services they need. And when they are doing, they're uh, paying a lot out of pocket, uh, particularly in purchasing medicines, and they're suffering a lot of financial hardship. So you can see for that very, very important population group, which again we heard uh, is very much a permanent feature of the urban population, uh, you know, they are not getting the health coverage they need at this, at this time. So the big question is, you know, how does one finance uh, the, their health care and everyone's health care? And um, there's one lesson that we have an all undoubtedly learn now right across the world is public financing. Public financing is the only way that you can reach universal health coverage, because that really means that the wealthy members of society subsidize services for the sick and the poor. Um, those rickshaw drivers will be on, on very low wages. You can see how difficult it is for them to access health services, um, you know, take time off from work to do that. And, and really the only way they are going to, to access the services they need is that they're massively subsidized and, and really better still they're provided for free. Provided by the state for free is the best way for them to, to get the health services they need. And this was Professor Brundtland at the uh, high level meeting of the United Nations last year saying this very clearly, that if there's one lesson the world has learned to just you can only reach UHC through public financing and I, and I think you know that's as true in Bangladesh as it is here in the UK and the United States and all, all over the world that we're all recognizing this and I think this sort of is a, a, a good way to look at where countries are on the journey towards universal health coverage and you can see that these relatively wealthy countries down here have a high public health spend as a share of GDP and obviously these are higher GDP levels as well, sort of countries like Australia and Japan. Um, the spending, you know, in the order of seven, eight, nine percent of GDP, and that has the impact of reducing the financial burden on households. People don't need to dip into their pockets and buy health services uh, because the state is basically paying for it. 
whereas you'll be aware, and, and you know, it was shown in the, in the previous presentation, that the poor people in Bangladesh are having to pay out of pocket. And really, this is a function of the very low level currently of public health expenditure in, in, in Bangladesh. Um, I've seen different figures in different reports, but, but typically, you know, figures of about 0.5% of GDP in public spending, and therefore it's people still needing healthcare, uh, people having to pay out of their own pockets. Um, I'm sorry, just to, to go back to this, the, 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 um, and what's very interesting about this transition, this move towards universal health coverage, is that countries move down this curve really quite quickly. When there is political commitment and public financing is found, you can see big shifts where countries suddenly go from a, a position where Bangladesh is at the moment to sort of move quite quickly down to, to these levels down here, where the financial burden is removed from households. And I think this graph illustrates this particularly well. This is a, a sort of a time series of, of uh, health financing, um, public health financing for, for a number of um, neighboring countries. And you can see there's a group here, um, Bangladesh, India, uh, Pakistan, and, uh, and Indonesia, that have had this chronically quite low level of public spending for, for a number of years. Things picking up a little bit in Indonesia recently, but not, not that massively so. And there's still big access problems in Indonesia. But these countries here, some, for example, China, started the, the beginning of the century um, at a comparable level. But they've seen quite big increases over short periods of time. Um, and so you have the, the tax in uh, health reforms in Thailand initially there. This is where the, the military government removed the taxing government and put even more public financing into the health system. Um, interestingly, China, this was in response to the SARS epidemic, a huge injection of public financing to socialize the health financing system. So you see big jumps, and this is basically what Bangladesh needs to do to enable everyone to get the health services they need, and in particular, the urban poor who we're discussing today. Um, and just a number of slides to illustrate how countries have done this. And, and the, this, is, uh, um, this is a graph from The, the Economist uh, showing the, um, the, the, pub, the patient financing, out-of-pocket financing, was dominating in, in China. But around the time of the SARS epidemic, the Chinese government realized that they'd made a big mistake by allowing private financing to dominate. And then they put a lot in of, of social health insurance and, and government financing to, in effect, socialize the health financing system. Um, this is the Prime Minister Taksin in 2001, uh, came to power at the end of the Asian financial crisis, the economy in a terrible state, and um, the World Bank told him at the time that, that Thailand couldn't afford a universal publicly financed health system, but, but Taksin showed amazing political commitment, said we will find the money, and um, they have got a very, very successful health system that's weathering this crisis particularly well and, and is, is a great example, I think, in, in Asia of a country that can suddenly make a, a, a step change towards universal health coverage. Uh, my own country, the national, um, in the uh, United Kingdom, we launched our national health service at the end of the Second World War when we were basically bankrupt. Um, and it was USA financing, really, that enabled the Labour government, and this is the Health Secretary, introducing the NHS, which we celebrate to this day, for example, with the, the Olympic Games ceremony in 2012. Again, UHC reforms coming out of a crisis. So I think, the, you know, the question is, you know, sort of might the current COVID crisis catalyze UHC reforms in a number of countries? And maybe this could be the opportunity that, that you need in, in Bangladesh to make this switch. Because what we're seeing with this crisis is that it's, it is putting pressure on governments and heads of state in particular to act, to give people access to health services. And one thinks, for example, of the vaccines coming down the line. People will want those, everyone will want them, and they'll need to be provided for free. Uh, so it's this aspect of 
financial protection from the cost of healthcare and people accessing health services. And people seeing with this, this terrible uh, pandemic and this virus, there should be universal entitlements. One mustn't leave groups behind like rickshaw pullers and, and, and other um, disadvantaged groups. And people want to see results quickly so they can get back to work and get back to normality. And you are already seeing a number of countries where I think the COVID-19 crisis is catalyzing UHC reforms. In fact, I joined a webinar very similar to this one in South Africa on Saturday, where, where the Minister of Health was openly talking about this exposing the inequalities in the South African health system and how they're going to use this to catalyze what they're calling their national health insurance reforms, which are in effect uh, a tax finance health system coming out of this crisis. And this is the president actually talking about it. Um, India is a very ex interesting example, of one that you may want to look at where there's a lot of discussion around how the Indian health system is responding to the crisis. And you might be aware that the prime minister has introduced Modi care reforms, but that's very focused on inpatient hospital care. And it's only really providing coverage to people below the poverty line, giving them access to inpatient hospital care. I think that's inadequate. And, and you know, that it's not covering enough people, it's covering the wrong services. And you can see that the financial burden on the, on the urban poor really is on people accessing ambulatory care and in, especially access to medicines. Now, Modi Care doesn't do anything for that. And um, talking to, to colleagues in India, there's a feeling that these reforms really aren't covering the population properly. Whereas in Delhi, the Delhi state government, and this is the chief minister here, actually with two of the elders who uh, we took to uh, what they call Mahala clinics, providing a universal free primary health care, um, diagnostics, medicines, exactly the types of things that the urban poor need. And I, I think your market research showing this very clearly that people need access to medicines and diagnostics. And these Mahala clinics are proving very, very successful at covering the health care needs of the urban poor in Delhi. And in fact, this has now been rolled out to nine Indian states. Um, the, the, the prime minister, it must be said, isn't particularly keen on this because it's doing something that, that is, is uh, uh, not his model but other state governments are seeing that this is very, very successful. And just as a suggestion that, you know, this might be a model that the government of Bangladesh wants to, to have a look at because it is proving very successful in meeting the needs of the population. And they've done a lot of market research, just like you've been talking about this morning, or sorry, this afternoon, uh, to uh, really provide services that, that, that people need. And one country that, you know, I, I think that people are looking at, you know, might the uh, this crisis even catalyze universal health care reforms in the United States? Uh, you know, a country that's allowed private financing to dominate. But this was just before the election where Hillary Clinton in a, in a town hall meeting was explicitly saying to to Joe Biden, now is the time with this covid crisis to introduce universal health care reforms. And very significantly, just um, um, two or three weeks ago, uh, the uh, Joe Biden in a tweet said, come January, they, they're going to, when he uh, comes to power, that you know, he's going to work with Congress to, to bring universal health coverage to, to the United States. So you know, this might be a very, very significant for the global campaign for UHC. Uh, and I think really indicates that, you know, sort of countries that, that haven't had this, uh, you know, sort of approach historically have got the opportunity to do this if there is the political leadership, which brings me to the ultimate question. You know, could this be the time uh, for Bangladesh to do this? You know, sort of might Her Excellency uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina uh, be able to catalyze UHC reforms in Bangladesh? And I think it would make a lot of sense 
to do that, looking at meeting the healthcare needs of the urban poor, uh, making sure that everyone's getting the health services they need. The Prime Minister has al already shown a determination to do this with the uh, rural poor, with the, with the community health uh, services there. And perhaps, you know, sort of to adapt, you know, this type of model to bring it into urban settings could be just the catalyst you need to bring universal health coverage to Bangladesh. So thank you very much, Lee. thank you. Thank you, Robert Yates. That was a exceedingly illuminating uh, cross-country analysis, giving us the range of choices. And I think the last uh, note that your uh, lecture leaves is that there is an opportunity here. It's an opportune moment. Uh, we can take the pandemic as a potential trigger to get our act together. So thank you very much for that and for joining and thanks to Chatham House for this. Uh, I will now, Philip, are you here? Uh, all right. Uh, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, Philip, okay, please. Uh, I'll now ask Philip briefly to mention about the health, uh, health realities of the socially excluded urban poor. Over to you, Philip. Okay, okay. I, I can actually show some slide. Do that. A, a, what document can I share the screen? Uh, technical team, please allow Philip to share his screen. Yes, I think you all can share. Right. Do you see the yes. screen? Yes, we can. we can. Okay, okay. I will be very brief because I mean, like on the rickshaw pullers, we don't have any survey findings. So, I mean, um, your report on the rickshaw pullers has been very detailed, and we all see the rickshaw pullers in all cities. But I mean, there are communities living in the city, in the cities that we don't see much. They are sort of invisible community. I mean, um, I don't talk about the smaller ethnic communities or I mean, tea communities uh, that Bihari, Kaiputro, Jolodas who live in the cities, around the cities. But I am going to talk a little bit about uh, horizons, sex workers, and uh, transgender and bedes, as you have just mentioned. I mean, uh, these are some of the uh, communities that are not only marginalized, but they are socially excluded, invisible, and I mean, they are in really appalling situation. If we talk a little bit about the Horizon communities, Horizons, they are, I mean, um, cleaners in the city and um, the population, they claim that they are 1.4 million, but actually the population is much smaller. As we can see from evidence, there are some 100,000 uh, people who are Horizons, but they are cleaners, there are also Bengali cleaners, but these people uh, belong to some eight ethnic communities. They are non-Bengalis and they live in colonies. Uh, as you can see uh, from two pictures, one is uh, in Dhaka, which is a kind of um, multi-story building. I mean, it looks good from outside, but I mean, once you go inside, it's not so, I mean, the situation is not so clean and not so good. But I mean, if you go to other colonies in Dhaka city and in district towns, you see the picture on the right. The, the situation is really appalling, congested. And uh, I mean, the population has increased, but the colonies remain the same size. So what we see is that they, they have great difficulties in accessing uh, healthcare facilities because of their low income. I mean, those who are on the payroll of city corporation and municipalities, they get relatively better pay, but those who are not on the payroll and those who are not in Dhaka, the, uh, the pay is appallingly low. It can be as low as Dhaka 100 per day. And you can imagine that, I mean, uh, the treatment or uh, medical care, the access is very poor. They generally go to um, hospitals, public hospitals, only those who are financially better off can go to private practitioners. And um, um, uh, basically, uh, they go to medical and 
I mean, there is a demand that, I mean, there are some special arrangements are made for this horizon people in particular. I mean, uh, the city corporation municipalities, uh, they can be uh, one, they can be two important platform and then they have their own organization. There are some community based organizations who can be of help. But as we have heard from our previous presentation, public spending is very important for the horizons to access better healthcare. So, I mean, there is a demand that, I mean, the horizons, uh, there are some special separate arrangement for, for the horizon people. Okay. Now we have another, another group of people, I mean, female sex workers in particular, um, I don't want to talk about male sex workers who are um, greater in, in number and size, but female sex workers, um, if we see at the statistic, there are some 4,000 female sex workers working in 11 brothels, but I mean, the rest of about 100,000 sex workers, they work on the streets, hotels and residences, and their conditions are appalling as we have seen uh, during pandemic situation is much worse. I mean, the health problems that the sex workers encounter are basically syphilis, gonorrhea, skin disease, tuberculosis, HIV, malnutrition, gastritis, cervical cancer, abortion, abdominal discharge and problems related to intake of steroid tablet. I mean, this is a serious problem in all brothels in particular and also on the street that they, they consume a lot of steroid tablet to look healthy and um, this has severe health problems. This cause severe health problems. For cervical cancer, they normally go to PG hospital. For other diseases, they visit health facilities that include medical college hospitals, there is a project, Nagor uh, Matri Shodhan and the Urban Healthcare Services Delivery Project for the poor people. Um, in Dhaka city, they visit uh, Midport Hospital and uh, there are a couple of drop-in center run by NGO like Lighthouse. So, um, I mean, um, the, those who work on the street, they actually spend time during their time at the drop-in centers the number has increased, but there are still, I think some a dozen drop-in center, which are really inadequate. I mean, at the drop-in center, they, they can take some rest, they can take showers, they can have their lunch and meals. So, I mean, for HIV and STD, they get some help from Lighthouse, Save the Children, etc. But the services are limited. And um, I mean, um, not all the sex workers can actually afford visiting private hospital and doctors. And uh, so a large number of them do not get treatment at all. I mean, what we see, uh, there are many NGOs working with the sex workers. Sex workers have also a network, some 30 organizations. Those are the organizations without registration but they at least have a network that can be utilized. There are some also international organizations like Save the Children. Uh, and then, I mean, the sex workers, particularly those working on the street, they also want separate healthcare facilities for them. We know that um, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Ministry of Social Welfare, Ministry of Women and Children Affairs and their affiliates are there to take care of um, vulnerable population. And then, um, I mean, the, the right. public spending is also important for them. I mean, they are relatively a smaller community, but I mean, they, they demand that all these concerned ministries pay greater attention to them and they get better treatment. And then we have uh, a community, Bede community, I mean, the population, according to Department of Social Services, 
is some uh, 76,000. According to their own estimate, there are some half million people. I mean, I don't know which is true, but I mean, there could be between uh, 200,000. And the bed is, they still live, um, I mean, many still live on boats, but the majority uh, live in tents that you can see in the picture on the right. I mean, uh, the condition is absolutely, I mean, horrible, uh, particularly for those who live in boat and, and tents. And uh, some of them have started to settle, but the percentage is very low. We don't have any, any clear survey findings, but I mean, um, the people living in boats and in tents, you can imagine that women in particular have great difficulties, particularly at the time of delivery. Most deliveries take place in boats and tents, and which is, um, which is very difficult. And um, uh, death at birth is also um, higher than the national ones. So, I mean, uh, access to health services is very minimum and vaccination is also very low among the, among the Bede community. So this Bede community, uh, particularly those or majority living in tents and boats, they, they demand special care. And how can you reach uh, all these communities? Actually, I mean, um, normally uh, they demand that the, that the public public agencies concerned ministries take care of them. But at the, um, at the ground level, I mean, uh, if health cards or facilities are offered to Union Parishad, Bujala Health Complex, there are community clinics, particularly the Bedes, they, they have very little access or they, they go, they, they don't go at all to Upujala Health Complex. They, mm. I mean, they, those who are better off financially, they go to doctors, private practitioners, okay. but those um, who are really poor, uh, they, uh, they get no treatment. So, I mean, these, these are just uh, okay. some, some of my notes okay. about these three communities. Mm. They are invisible and they really need greater state attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sam. Thank you, thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we have heard, uh, you know, the ground realities, and we have also heard the macro challenges, particularly related to financing. Now we will come to our panel, uh, Dr. Shams Alam. Uh, you, uh, uh, I hope you can stay for a little while longer. If you can hear one or two more panelists, then we will bring you in. Is that is okay? So I will uh, now invite the. Uh, Director General of the Health Economics Unit at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Dr. Shahadat, Mohammed Shahadat Hussain. Uh, please, the floor is yours, and I request each of the panelists to take about five to six minutes in the interest of time. Thank you. Dr. Mohammed Shahadat Hussain. Uh, Honorable Chair, the Executive Chairman of PPRC, Dr. Hussain Jil Rahman, respected Chief Guest, Dr. Samsul Alung, Respected guest of honor, Tomo Hujumi, other prudent uh, guests and uh, panelists, and uh, others who are connected to the Zoom platform. Uh, good evening and salam alaikum. It's, of course, a great pleasure for me to be part of this very important discussion. Uh, I have uh, heard all the deliberation made by the prudent presenters. Basically, the first presentation that is the study findings of health realities of extrapolars and other urban poor conducted by PPRC with the support of UNICEF. I think a lot of avenues are clear to us. I'm really amazed by seeing the aspirations of the extrapolars. I think all the aspirations is very much consistent with our general ideas. They, they uh, urged for the solvency, that is about 59.8%. Uh, and they asked for the education of the children about 50%, this is 47%, so far I realize. And uh, they only 35%, uh, they just uh, wanted to land 
at the release and another 35%, they are uh, willing to have a house in their village. So their expression is very, very simple. And uh, so for the uh, beneficiary priority that is uh, uh, found out in, from the study, it is also very much uh, consistent. They raised their financial hardship about 49.8%. And they are very much concerned about the doctor's behavior. It is about one third, that is 32.1%. And doctor's availability is about one tenth, that is 10.6%. And proximity of their uh, areas, that is the access to their healthcare, is only 7.4%. All these findings indicate that the healthcare facilities that is now existing in our country, it is not so bad. We have a lot of limitations. So for the total health expenditure is concerned, you know that our total health expenditure is only $37. It is one of the lowest in the world. It is not comparable with other developed country because some countries like USC, their total health expenditure is 268 times more than us. So we cannot compare it with other countries. Still, the healthcare status of our country is not so bad. I am just uh, referring uh, one of the report that is uh, uh, published by Lancet in 2018. They made a, a statement that the healthcare status of Bangladesh is better in some countries, even better than India. We are far ahead than Pakistan, than uh, uh, Afghanistan, Nepal, and Bhutan also. So if we consider all these issues, I find uh, the healthcare facilities that is ongoing in our country, it is, it is still, uh, I think, encouraging but we have a lot of limitations that is revealed from the study report. And uh, it is rightly mentioned that the issue pullers, their economic condition is still uh, not up to the mark. They are facing a lot of problems because of their economic condition. And to receive health care from the private healthcare providers is very much related to the economic condition. So they will face Tremendous problems in receiving healthcare from the private uh, healthcare providers. It's, it's very, very normal. But what the government facilities are providing in the urban areas, that a big concern. In this issue, I must say that healthcare providing is a multi stakeholder responsibility. It's not possible for a single provider to cover all the population. Ultimately, in the urban areas, the healthcare, primary healthcare, facilities provided by the Ministry of Local Government Division. This is a very big problem in our country that all the providers are not well coordinated. It is, it is very often said that our health budget is very, very poor. It is even less than 5%. Though WHO prescribed it should be at least 10%. But I'd like to actually uh, I mentioned that this statistics is not at all correct. Because you know that in our country, other than the health ministry, 13 other ministries and divisions, they are using health budget from their own ministry's budget. Say for Minister of Public Administration, there is a Sharkari Commissary uh, Hospital, Minister of Railway, they have their own hospitals, Ministry of Social Welfare, Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Defense, they have their own health facilities. And for that, about 2,000 crore taka are allocated from the, uh, our national budget. This year, if we see the budgetary provision, we'll find that only 29,000 crore taka has been allocated for the health ministry out of the five. Uh, 567,000 uh, crores in the total budget. It is only 5%. But apart from this, we know that 10,000 crore taka has been kept 
to combat the COVID situation. And another 1,780 to 1,000 crore has been kept for other ministries for the health related issues. So in total, our total budget for health is more than 41,000 crore. It is about 7.3% of the total budget. So budgetary allocation is not support, but the problem is that how much we are able to use this money effectively. It is because of the lack of coordination. Earlier I mentioned that 13 other ministries and uh, divisions are involved in providing healthcare throughout the country. But who will take the leading role? That's the big question. Today we are discussing about the uh, urban primary healthcare to the urban areas. There is a uh, urban primary healthcare service delivery project. They're providing healthcare to the urban areas. But the problem is that their human resource is very much limited. So they are not actually providing the service as required. So you see in the, in the rural areas, the uh, status of immunization is better than that of urban areas. It's because in the urban areas, the health services provided by the urban uh, uh, primary health care service delivery project is not so effective because of some limitations. Today, the uh, uh, PD of that uh, uh, project is here, is my friend, Mr. Abdul Hakim. But he's very much, uh, I think, uh, uh, committed to his job. But due to the limitations, it's not possible for him to provide the urban extrapolers these services what they are actually willing for. So we should think these issues from a practical uh, point of view. Hmm. Our, we have a lot of actual achievement in the health sectors. I must say that in the MDG, our Prime Minister received a lot of global actually recognition for our performance in the health sectors. We are very much proud for that. But in the SDG, so far my knowledge is concerned, we are facing a lot of challenges because of our preparedness. We know that in the SDG, one particular goal, that is goal number three, is targeted on health and well-being. There is 13 target and 27 indicators. I have actually uh, gone through all the indicators mentioned in the SDG. And it's really very difficult for us to achieve all the target as we committed. Because this- okay, sir, We'll request you to complete one minute because Chief Guest oh, has- Okay, yes. okay th thanks, thanks a lot, sir. I will, commit, I will complete with one minute. Actually, uh, at the end of what I want to say that uh, health service is a cross-cutting issue. A lot of stakeholders are involved with this process. So uh, the roles and responsibility of all their stakeholders is very much important to achieve the targeted performance in the health sector. In the urban areas, uh, although the primary uh, health uh, care service delivery project is concerned uh, for the primary health care, but there's a lot of tertiary level hospitals that is governed by the health ministry and other ministries. So if we all combinedly work together uh, mm -hmm. and with a uh, platform of coordination, then I think all the minor issues that are actually, actually delineated from the research study will be able to address all the problems efficiently. With these fears, let me uh, conclude my speech. Thanks a lot for patient sharing. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed uh, Shah Hussain, and thank you for this very frank assessment of the realities, also the opportunities and uh, initiatives that Bangladesh is also taking under the limited uh, uh, constraint conditions. Our chief guest uh, has to leave for another meeting, so I will now request our chief guest, Dr. Shamsul Alam, uh, to make his speech, and we are looking forward to your intervention. Dr. Shamsul Alam. Please unmute him. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Hoshanjil Rahman, Executive Chairman, PPRC, and uh, 
Tomohojumi representative, UNICEF Bangladesh, uh, Mr. M. M. Nasiruddin, Mr. Maya Bendarnant, uh, who is Chief of Health, UNICEF Bangladesh, mm, and uh, Robbie H. Chetam House, London, and other uh, discussions will be participating. One already presented his discussion, others will be participating very soon. Uh, I had to seek permission to leave because I have another uh, no, uh, seminar to join at six uh, virtually, but I had to be joined five minutes before or something like that. So I thank uh, the PPRC and those who organized this important, uh, uh, important uh, seminar or webinar, whatever we call on important topics, particularly revealing uh, rickshaw pullers, uh, life, livelihood, and other uh, poor section of the uh, our population, particularly Bedes, uh, as uh, uh, our Philip Gain presented. And uh, I learned many things uh, from Rob uh, Yates also, seeing Bangladesh's uh, comparative role uh, in health expenditure and uh, how much we, we, we are spending. Uh, I should say quite revealing and very focused way the Dr. Hoshin Jalohman presented his, you know, uh, his uh, research findings. Uh, many things uh, we can learn from there and there are many policy implications of those findings. Uh, certainly we know uh, of our low coverage uh, in health services in Bangladesh, no doubt about that. These are our health organization's finding uh, as he reported. Uh, with high financial uh, hardship uh, people face when they, uh, when they go with uh, getting health service or accessing health services. Um, nutrition gap is there, we all know we suffer from a nutrition gap and that's why we have uh, stunting, we have under, uh, underweight, uh, we have you no know, wastage, all this. But one thing uh, is very interesting as uh, World Health Organization uh, reported and again referred by Hussein Jilohan that 55% of population uh, has access to safe drinking water. As we used to know, 48% uh, no, uh, has access to safe drinking water and 19% having access to improve water. So that, that was very heartening to learn that we have 55% uh, safe uh, drinking or access to safe drinking water. That's really good. But hand washing situation is quite, you know, uh, quite frustrating, which is 38% uh, as, uh, as reported by Hussein uh, Jillu Rahman. At the time of this COVID situation, hand washing, you no, know, APR is very important uh, component of our life uh, style. Uh, that is uh, being related to uh, protection, getting protection from the uh, COVID and all other uh, diseases. And child stunting, uh, as reported in the World Health Report, is 30.8%. Uh, this is also a bit, you know, a bit higher what we reported earlier, perhaps 27% or so having uh, stunting, child stunting. Any of these are figures, but what Hussein Jilur Rahman revealed uh, about the life, lifestyles, facilities, aspirations of the extrapolars, really very revealing, I should say. And it is really hurting to know. There are some graduates who also go with rickshaw pulling, which is 0.25%, as he reported. Uh, it's really interesting. Some graduates also go with uh, profession of rickshaw pulling. And 0.75%, as he said, uh, having SSC uh, certificates who uh, used to go with uh, rickshaw pulling. And uh, rickshaw pulling is not a you know, part time job, as many of them, they do rickshaw pulling or go with rickshaw pulling occupation, which is 93%. So that, that means uh, they took rickshaw pulling as uh, their uh, main profession which is, you know, very dependent on what drudgery, I should say, a very pathetic, you know, to, uh, pulling rickshaw, carrying two, three persons in the rickshaw. So anyway, they live with, 87% live with family in Dhaka. Is that 
all that say actually uh, the shuffling as a way of their life. And 55% send no money to village, meaning they live in Dhaka and uh, they actually uh, wholly uprooted from village as it seems by this uh, figure. And uh, if we consider as he reported uh, you know, food security situation, as I, as I can uh, remember, 69.6% uh, do not drink any milk in a week, oh my goodness, and you see 26% eat no meat uh, and 11% uh, eat no egg. You see the situation uh, with our, our rickshaw pulling community. So during lockdown, they also went to it unemployment, you know, 38% uh, as uh, he reported, uh, went to it unemployment. And uh, eight percent of them, you know, suffer from chronic disease. All this, what I am saying, is all are very pathetic, and uh, really, uh, this has big plus implications. We say, urban health services need to be strengthened, and streamlined. Whatever we say, we need to go with huge social protection, particular focus social protection, addressing urban uh, poverty. Uh, that is the, uh, I hope. Uh, take away from this study. And uh, you see, so pathetic. 53% uh, go for medical, you know, uh, for medical advice to pharmacy, 53%. I mean, you see the pathetic situation. There is no doctor. Maybe only 15 or 15% 15 have some uh, uh, doctors sit there sometimes. But actually, those who sell medicine, uh, they advise to patients. Uh, with the, with the, with this is a without no prescription, they provide medicines to poor people. But one good thing is really encouraging these rickshaw pullers also go with uh, birth registration, which is 78%, it's quite high, it's in near the national average. And uh, they go with, I, I felt very a bit, you know, a bit uh, happy. They go with. 68.8% go with family planning, you know, they, they uh, adopt family planning services. And uh, their big aspiration is to be solvent. And uh, other than this, they, uh, they are big aspiration. They need, they, they want their children to be educated. You see, quite good aspiration, I should say. Uh, above and, uh, where and above, I should say, uh, while we are graduating, uh, certainly we, we left the stigma of low-income country. We became a lower middle income. Tree. Now we are going to be graduated in 2021 assessment and finally to be announced in 2024. If everything uh, goes well, certainly we'll be graduating. And we are aspiring to be a developed country by 2041. And we want to be an upper middle income country by 2031. What all these say, really, we have to care more for our health services, need to care for our education services. If we, uh, because without human uh, development, we cannot attain any other targets, uh, whatever, you know, dreamy it uh, uh, looks. We need to strengthen our human resources. So, the lesson I can take from uh, this presentation, all the three or four pre three presentations, mm, we need to uh, emphasize more on our, our social protection services that need to be increased really. If we, if we you know, uh, consider only the social services support to poor without uh, pension schemes, it is only 1.2%. Uh, which is not very, you know, very high figure comparing to other comparable countries, if I say. So uh, I would expect uh, wider circulation of these results for creating civil society awareness and uh, uh, to other policymakers to you know, know these uh, figures. And uh, these are the, you know, grassroots realities that we need to know about every macro figures may not tell everything. You see our out of pocket expenses above 60, uh, no, above 60%, uh, 70%, as I saw here. 
So it's a you know, quite big figure for any person, poor or rich even. A richer can afford, but uh, we have 20.5% poor. How they go with, uh, no, uh, with spending 70% out of pocket uh, expenditure for, you know, uh, for taking health care. So all these really point to, uh, as I'm, I, I'm in mean, the final stage of completing our age five year plan. So I personally feel, I mean, if I think of uh, social welfare or think of uh, no, our uh, uh, welfare of other general population, we need to emphasize more on healthcare services, particularly urban healthcare services, which was not much cared uh, in the earlier, uh, I should say so. Uh, I, I, I assure you that uh, I will see this thing and you will see that uh, we'll go with uh, supporting more, no, our one healthcare services. Uh, and uh, we will certainly devote more attention to, you know, more health spending. Does not matter 13 or 14 ministries go uh, implement health services, whatever needed, whether people get services, whether people get delivery, that is important at the end of the day. So if coordination need to be improved, that should be improved. Uh, so um, uh, I should say at the end, I, I felt quite, you know, uh, quite informed with all these figures and presentation. I thank PPRC and I would try to take, you know, lessons how to how we can reflect in our national pl plan at least if there is if we write uh, at least there will be benchmarking to say uh, that uh, this is written in your plan so you implement it so i'm honestly saying uh, I, I am quite uh, uh, quite convinced that uh, these poor people need to be supported whether prostitute whether rickshaw pullers or whatever profession they pursue uh, poor people need to get more attention uh, because in the big uh, broad picture no, scenario, our income level is increasing. Uh, we need to take all possible measures that inequality does not uh, go rising. Uh, that would be our uh, trust in the five-year plan, this age five-year plan, I can tell you. So uh, I wish to stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Hoshan uh, Jalu Rahman. I owe to you really good, good, good presentations you, you have here. So thank you all. Uh, have safe, uh, no, and uh, healthy, you know, <laughs> life. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Shamsil Alam, for uh, this. And I think uh, we are very happy that Eight five year plan is an important policy window to at least to enter you know important issues, and I'm so happy to hear that urban primary urban health will be figuring prominently. And I think for all of us, one of the challenges will be to convince the all the policy audience that mm -hmm. investing here is an actually investment. It's not a budgetary burden, and hopefully our report will try to bring that out more clearly. So thank you very much, Dr. Shamsul Alam, for being with us. You are always supportive of these uh, important discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, I am quite honored. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll continue. And now, Dr. Abul Faiz, former Director General of the Health Services, uh, Professor Abul Faiz. Five, uh, around six minutes. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Uh, Chief guest who has just left, uh, distinguished panelist, Dr. Hussain Jalil Haman, Philip, Rob, and uh, Mr. Nasiruddin, and others, and Lanet audience, and including Dr. UNICEF representative. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Uh, it is indeed a very, uh, very excellent three presentations, uh, which provided us some insight about the realities, harsh realities of urban health care in Bangladesh. Uh, although we, we are progressing, 
the parameters indicators in urban areas is better than rural areas but in the urban areas the three presentations gives us an opportunity to understand what is the ground reality uh, if i am allowed to quote from uh, invisible cities as philip mentioned invisible people invisible cities by italo calvino where kublai khan says to marco polo that you take delight not in seven or 70 wonders but the answer it gives to a question dr hussein jillu created lots of question for us to answer in fact uh, again in the invisible uh, cities they mentioned that if you like to see darkness around you you have to shine your eyes i think these three presentations at least has shown our some lights so that we can really see the darkness around us the the realities are that uh, uh, they are the 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 marginalized community they they have got uh, quite poor uh, in in terms of performance in terms of indicators but there are opportunities uh, for example from your study uh, from study of the dr jillur he mentioned that well if we only uh, reshape the about timing of the services in the evening and night possibly the the restapular or other people who used to work in the daytime they can get, have the this the self services uh, similarly the adaptation adaptation in terms of the the healthcare delivery by the uh, ngo or other sectors where they have to very few of them have, have got cards so i think the 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 introduction of the the cards for the so called this marginalized group or poor people might improve the the situation uh from the presentation of uh, from this chatham house uh, he highlighted that there is an opportunity opportunity of reform need of reform has been highlighted by by uh, from the presentation and uh, from the, from chatham house presentation it is obvious that this is the time for to take the opportunity for example you, in uk there was a reform during after second world war in thailand and turkey they have reformed during economic crisis i think to in covid 19 gave us an opportunity to to take that forward that to put this, this up to the highest political level that we need reform targeting universal health coverage i think i do, i do not like to utter the word something like modi care as robert mentioned in somewhere that the, the, the doctor uh, samshil alam would be nice person to take it forward something like hasine care or something like targeting universal health coverage uh, i think the opportunity uh, will, it will come later on but for the time for the time being immediately what we can do we can we, ha we have got some examples you know the the municipality was established in in 1863 in chotogram first followed by the indakai in 64 and we have got good lessons from chotogram city corporations where by the chotogram city corporation they have got some minimum level of healthcare delivery we aspire to have at least those type of healthcare delivery in dhaka city i know that there is new strategy new urban health strategy is going to be implemented i i know that it is going to be adopted first and then it will be implemented whereby the the responsibility is provided to ministry of health to the ministry of local government and including the local governments then possibly at that time the the if we can implement properly then the uh, possibly the scenario related to urban health particularly the the marginalized the slum population the health of the slum population will gradually improve we are looking forward to to in, in that and 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 i'm sure uh, but i i at the end i like to say i do not have any uh, answer why the the covid 19 is so much low amongst the rickshaw puller 0.1% only i think you you identified lots of questions that needs to be addressed by doing further studies thank you very much indeed thank for you. giving me thank the opportunity you. Thank, thank you doctor you. thank you doctor raul faiz now i want to bring in uh, mr abdul hakim majumdar who is the additional secretary and project director of the urban primary healthcare services uh, delivery project 
Mr. Abdul Hakim. Five to six minutes again, please. Thank you. Sir, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Sir, can you hear me? We can hear you. Sir, yes, we can hear you. Sir, respected chair, respected chair, Mr. Jilri Roman, sir, uh, and all respected participants and uh, this is my great pleasure to raise myself for his dedication. Today, we have seen three presentations, those were very important to us. So, uh, uh, we have. Um, you, Mr. Mr. Hakim, if you can speak a little louder, sir. if you can speak a little louder, sir, sir. please speak uh, a little louder. I, sir, can you hear me, sir, now? And now it's very clear. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mr. Hakim. Mr. Hakim. Uh, I'll request uh, Joyan Kumar to perhaps phone him and explain that we can hear him. He should just speak a little louder. Mr. Hakim. Uh, we seem to have lost him. Okay. Uh, We'll bring him on once he comes back. I want to bring in now Professor Dr. Tahmina Banu, uh, pediatric surgeon and director of Chitong Research Institute for Child Children's Surgery. Tahmina Banu. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Can I share my screen? I'd yes. like to. Uh, technical team, please allow her to share her screen. Yes, ma'am, you can go ahead. Okay. Can you see my slides? Not yet. Uh, not yet. I'm going to share with some screening uh, we have done in Chittagong, Chattogram. One in slum children, one on school health, and another on cancer screening. Can you see my screen? No, we cannot. So oh, okay. if, this, if there is a technical problem, you can just go ahead and speak. Okay. No, we okay. can see it now. We can see it now. Okay. So we have done a screening of slum children, the one big slum in the railway area, where we have screened 312 children from 230 household. 20% of them did not complete their EPI schedule, the immunization schedule. And 96% didn't know their blood group. 5.6% of them has developmental delay 6% of them ha has anemia. And we found that they have 27 surgical and non-surgical cases. Among them, 11 were birth defects. And in the school health screening, we did a screening in Dr. Kastagi Government Girls High School, both morning shift and uh, day shift, total 1,315 students. Less than uh, 10,000 Bangladeshi taka were earned by their guardian in 3% of these girls. And their age range from 90 uh, to 17 years. 43% were not dewormed. 39, 1% were underweight. 14% were overweight and 2.8% uh, were obese. 45% have some problems in their eyesight. 38% have some allergy to various substances. 33% were suffering from headache on and off. 
and 25% uh, girls has, <coughs> excuse me, some menstrual problems. And we found 4.5% girls have some sort of birth defects. About the cancer screening, in total 15 days, we screened the hospital admitted uh, cancers in Chirang Medical College Hospital, uh, which is a public hospital and Chotogram Mao Shishu Hospital, which is a pub, uh, private hospital. And we found that among only in this, within these 15 days, 704 histologically confirmed cancer patients were admitted. And 68% of them came from the urban area. 74% of them were in the pediatric age group. 14% had family history of cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, blood cancer, lung cancer, stomach cancer were the common cancers. In female, breast cancers was the common cancer. Lung cancer was common in male uh, patients. And in children, blood cancer was most common. So I wanted to just share with you these screening results from Chitoram. And about the COVID impact, because I'm a surgeon, we have seen that our all the emergency, uh, you know that 12% of the newborns in Bangladesh has serious birth defects. But they are uh, born with serious birth defects and they need immediate surgeries. But COVID has an impact on them. Uh, they were, these services were hindered also uh, emergency services for trauma and cancer surgery were in, uh, impaired. And we have a huge backlog of routine surgical operations due to COVID. And also because the families are economically compromised, they have deferred to bring their children with the surgical needs to uh, the surgeons. So these are our experience and I just wanted to share with you. I know that UHC needs uh, includes all people, including children, but children's agenda is not uh, prioritized in the UHC uh, programs all over the world. So this is, I'd like that it will be uh, given proper attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamina Banu. I don't know whether Mr. Hakim was able to rejoin, uh, but if he does, we'll bring him in again. I'll now request uh, Dr. Mushtaq Raza Chaudhary. He is the convener of the Bangladesh Health Watch and a very important uh, civil society advocate on health issues. Mushtaq Raza Chaudhary, please. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and uh, yesterday, as you mentioned earlier, was the uh, Universal Healthcare Day. And uh, I sent you all a belated uh, USC Day, uh, Day wishes. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very important meeting that uh, uh, you are hosting today. And I have heard uh, many important and thoughtful perspectives given by uh, the speakers. Uh, and 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 uh, there are a lot of foot of uh, foot for thoughts in these in these uh, ideas that that has come that have come already through these uh, presentations. Uh, uh, the chair of the session in, in his presentation, of course, he uh, emphasized the need for urgent and uh, 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 immediate health sector reform. Uh, and I, I was also very, very, very happy to see my friend uh, Robert Yates. Uh, he was he was making a very passionate plea for a, a publicly funded uh, universal healthcare system. Uh, we know that uh, that we have heard also from Professor Fires that uh, that the, the crisis uh, uh, lead to reforms, and there are many examples for that. Uh, we have heard about the national health system, national health service in, in the UK, and also the the Thai experience after the uh, uh, the Asian financial crisis, which led to uh, the 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 establishment of one of the finest universal health coverage program in the world now. Uh, so 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 this uh, this uh, uh, COVID crisis 
has really given us an historic opportunity uh, to, to do something about our health system. Uh, and uh, uh, in the words of uh, Hillary Clinton, as uh, 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 Robert uh, Years was, was showing us, that uh, uh, it will be a terrible crisis to waste. Uh, uh, so, so, so we have to make best efforts to make best use of the of the of the of the of the of the crisis that we are passing through. Uh, and and we know that the government of Bangladesh has full commitment uh, to universal health coverage, and they have made it uh, 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 very clear time and again. Even last year uh, in September, the the Prime Minister, Honourable Prime Minister herself. Uh, she sort of uh, 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 told of her commitment to uh, to to, to uh, attain or uh, to achieve universal health coverage. Uh, uh, so 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 we it seems that we have those kind of commitments, but uh, we are not seeing much happening. Uh, and uh, we also know that that there are uh, other examples also. Uh, where uh, 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 where we have seen that that if you want to really do a good reform, there may be uh, uh, sort of uh, barriers and and opposition to that, and we have seen that uh, after the after the after, after the uh, the Spanish flu uh, in the U.S. Uh, we know that the Spanish flu killed uh, about 100 million people, and uh, one of the uh, best things that came out of this uh, of this um, of this uh, terrible uh, crisis uh, was the complete overhaul uh, of the American medical education system, uh, and uh, uh, it 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 uh, and the establishment of uh, public health as a as a discipline. And we also know that uh, as a as a as a consequence of this uh, of this uh, of uh, 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 the Spanish flu in the U.S. Uh, uh, about half of the medical schools that were there were shut down because those were not uh, up to the mark in terms of quality. Uh, and many of these uh, uh, medical schools that were closed are very uh, sort of uh, uh, famous ones. But the government there was very sort of uh, adamant and they prevailed and they, they did that. Similarly, if you want to really do uh, 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 UHC reform in this country, we, the government has to be very, very bold. Uh, uh, and uh, we know that the government uh, can be bold. We have seen just now we have uh, the Ponda Bridge there. Uh, so, so they have done it, and it's possible for the government uh, to really go for such, such kind of reforms uh, if, if they are really serious about that. And one of the, one of the uh, problems that we are facing now is the lack of money, of course, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we we feel really embarrassed to see that that we are the uh, 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 we we live in a country which spends the least in health. This is a very kind of an embarrassment for us. Uh, uh, but but fortunately, I have uh, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Shamsalaram has left, but but uh, in the eight fiber plan. They are planning to 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 or they are proposing to increase the 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 allocation from 0.9 percent or 7 percent to 2 percent, uh, uh, which which uh, 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 which is a welcome thing, but but it all depends on the implementation of the of the plan, and even in the seventh five-year plan, there was a proposition that uh, the, the 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 investment will be increased from 0.7 percent to 2.1 percent, but that never happened uh, so 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 just having uh, a number in, in the or a, or, a, or a proposal in the in the in the plan doesn't doesn't mean much unless unless you, you take real steps to uh, uh, to implement it and uh, also that uh, that uh, uh, even if the government comes forward with more money the question is how you are going to spend this money uh, and and uh, there comes the role for universal health coverage so if you have, uh, we have seen in many countries that if you increase the uh, the uh, GDP spending by just one percent, you can cover all the costs that will come through for the for the USC. So 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 we have those examples, and it is it is very important that uh, the uh, uh, the government realizes the importance of this, and 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 really take the bold step now.
uh, to, to implement the universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Mushtaq, uh, for that. Uh, now I want to bring our last speaker, Professor Sayed Abdul Hamid of the Dhaka University. Uh, Professor Hamid, floor is yours. And if Mr. Hakim is there, we will bring him in at the end. Hamid. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for arranging such a uh, uh, nice uh, uh, ceremony. Uh, I'm very glad to see uh, 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 the, all the presenters uh, presented very nicely, uh, uh, especially the rickshaw pullers. It's, 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 it's basically, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, found the real, real uh, ground realities. Uh, and uh, uh, also the, what Philip Guinan presented as yes, the excluded groups, that's good, good findings. And uh, Robert Yert, uh, yeah. Uh, he's basically uh, focused on the public financing and also uh, how can we capitalize uh, this this COVID issue to make make reform. That's very good. Um, uh, it's interesting that we have seen uh, seen some findings from the rickshaw puller service that people are moving to to the village to take the immunization and other services. That's very surprising that we we even cannot give them the basic service uh, uh, for living in uh, living in living in the urban areas. Uh, 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 basically, uh, all this and also uh, the timing, timing of this, uh, timing of the services that the rickshaw pullers has uh, aspired in, in, in their, their uh, while responding the questionnaire is uh, that means 74, 74 percent of the rickshaw rickshaw puller basically demanding uh, the evening and the night services. But un uh, unfortunately, our all of our facilities are basically being closed uh, uh, before two o'clock. So. We know all these uh, uh, findings uh, from the earlier studies as well, and uh, uh, we know we, we we gave suggestion in different times uh, how to solve this problem. And also, one of the studies of PPRC earlier uh, uh, also identified the gaps in the urban areas and 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 make um, uh, good suggestions to uh, to to do the reforms and and continue the services for the urban poor. And based on all these things, we basically. Uh, we basically uh, uh, drafted the urban health strategies and the urban health strategies has already uh, uh, been presented in the uh, urban uh, coordination committee meeting uh, 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 shared, by the, shared by the secretary and hopefully uh, uh, the things will be moving, uh, moving forward to uh, take care of all these things. Uh, what is basically, uh, uh, I, 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 want to, uh, I want to point out some of the issues that we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, suggested in the urban health strategy that is basically aligned with the findings of the Riksha Polar Survey. That means uh, extending the opening hour of the government facilities and the NGO uh, facilities uh, uh, under the urban primary healthcare facilities. That means if we extend some of, uh, so extend the opening hour of the government facilities, that means medical college hospital and other uh, other institutions uh, of the uh, the of the of uh, of uh, 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 Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, are giving primary health care. So if we can extend uh, the opening hours, so some of the problem can be uh, can be solved. And also uh, here uh, maybe Hakim Bai is here. Uh, so if he can take initiative to even extending uh, uh, the opening hour of the urban primary health care project. Uh, 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 in, in the evening and the afternoon that some of the problems can be solved. We have also suggested the catchment area based urban uh, uh, GP model uh, in, in, the, uh, in the urban uh, in, the, in, in, in uh, the urban health strategy. And, and, and recently we have developed a, a catchment area based GP model uh, 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 and from the support from the UNICEF and uh, Swedish CEDA. Uh, and that model is also uh, uh, will be presenting soon, soon in the in, in, in the ministry in front of the secretary, and hopefully that will have uh, have have uh, 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 create some hope to uh, take it forward. Um, uh, what we need is basically we have uh, uh, we have investment in health in the sector, but the problem is that our investment is is piecemeal basis. It's not integrated. So we, in 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 the in the reform package. Uh, we should basically think about the integrated package, integrated things, the master plan based uh, uh, things to uh, make it forward. And what I want to uh, give more emphasis that we are 
basically uh, we basically focus on hard uh, uh, hard investment that means hardware related things but we need to we need to we need to uh, make more investment in improving the soft skill uh, especially the behavior of the doctors and uh, other other health force and 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 the skill level and so on so these are basically the things uh, that we need to uh, that we need to uh, that we need to uh, consider while we are uh, will 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 be doing this uh, reform uh, uh, package or in investment in the health sector another thing is that you know uh, 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 request you to finish in one minute please uh, okay thank you uh, so so basically uh, uh, another another suggestion that we gave and you you also gave earlier that if you know the ministry of health and family welfare has the health workforce, but the city corporation, the municipality, they have sub center, but uh, the, 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 the health workforce is not there. And uh, because of uh, because of that career path and many many other issues, basically uh, the doctor uh, uh, doctors and other health work, uh, workforce uh, basically they do not want, want to work in in these facilities. So uh, 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 deportation of the Ministry of Health and uh, Family Welfare workforce uh, can be can be deployed there to make this health, health center uh, 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 workable. So these are basically uh, the things that we have suggested in the urban health strategy. And if this urban health strategy is, is basically implemented, then uh, many of the problems will be solved. And this can be, this can be, this can be basically uh, think of when we are doing the reform uh, package in the urban health as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hamid. And I would again ask if Mr. I can see his window, Mr. Hakim. Uh, are you listening to us? Sir. I can see you are trying. Uh, yes, please. please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I am hearing you, sir. My yes, we can, we can hear you. Sir, you know, sir, sir uh, I, am a pro I am a project director for one primary health care project. You know, sir, better, sir. Uh, I, I see, sir, project has a lot of limitations eh, because each is a time-bound action plan we should go for long-term program for healthcare, sir. Uh, we are suffering from the commitment, sir. Uh, we have, sorry to say, sir, there is no wing or section in LGD for sir, primary healthcare services, sir. But our ministry's responsibility is ensuring healthcare, not primary healthcare, sir, urban healthcare, sir, not health primary, sir, including tertiary and, sir, mid-level, sir. Here, sir, uh, I have some proposals. We should go for mass awareness build up, sir. We should create, sir, groups for rickshaw pullers and low level uh, personals. Uh, we should, sir, bring them under database, sir, so that we can, sir, locate them, sir. Uh, we, 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 I propose to create, to, sir, form a social healthcare catalyst, sir. Those who will bring them in, sir, healthcare center. We should establish GP model, catchment area, as Hamid Bhai told, sir, discussed. Uh, we can introduce double shift, not in only answer, uh, urban primary centers, sir. We should introduce, sir, in hospitals also, sir, government hospitals in all level. We have some double shift clinic CRHCs in some places, including Dhaka and Silir, sir. Because of finance, we are not able to go for sir, all our centers. Sir, I have every proposal to sir, create a uh, healthcare company, nationwide healthcare company, with this association of all healthcare companies, sir. But sir, it will not overburden government if we can establish a healthcare company, sir. Uh, sir, we, we need strong political commitment in all level commitment. Because health is really as possible. Health insurance is a basic need, sir, for us. Uh, this is my, these are my suggestions, sir. Okay. Um, I you. think today's discussion is very fruitful. If you go for action, sir, it will be good for this, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Hakim. Uh, hope your project, you know, does continue to try and find innovative solutions even under constraints. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I've seen on the chat box, Mr. 
Dr. Riyad Mahmood, Nina Vandermark, Bachera Akhtar, and others have, you know, posed questions, etc. We've taken note of that. Uh, but uh, we are in the interest of time. I think now I will request our guest of honor, Tomu Huzumi, Huzumi, uh, country representative of UNICEF, to make his uh, comments. Tomu. Thank you, uh, Zirubai. Uh, esteemed uh, panel members, uh, dear participants, it's really my great pleasure to be here today to attend this webinar. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the presenters for their presentations, uh, three of them, you know, all of which are extremely informative and uh, eye-opening. I think uh, one of the many things that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic taught us this year is that many of the systems that we thought had been firmly established are actually very fragile including a range of social services. This is a wake up call to the world on the need of universal social protection, including universal health coverage. While the crisis like this one is nothing but terrible, a crisis is also the time when people's health need for the collective action is the strongest. As Dr. Yates showed in his presentation, with reference to China in post-SARS period. At the same time, we all know that we human beings are very forgetful. So we must strike the iron while it is still hot. We must build a system which provides essential health services to all as a basis for sustainable and equitable development. And while doing so, we need to pay special attention to those areas and populations that are particularly vulnerable and also so far undercovered, including the disadvantaged population in other areas where the health system has been very fragmented. Hence the importance of today's webinar. When we... Sorry. Excuse me. Importance of the... Uh, uh, iPhone City is responding to my, <laughs> my oration. <laughs> okay, so uh, when we um, uh, look at the health system in Bangladesh, there are both very notable strengths and also substantial room for improvement, many of which have already been mentioned. For the former strengths, we can mention the immunization program as an example which covers 83% of children under one year of age with all antigens. That's really commendable. The community clinic in the rural areas uh, is another great example. In these clinics, as you know, preventive, promotive, and based curative care is offered free of charge to everyone. These show the commitment of the government of Bangladesh to primary health care. So there are elements in the health systems of Bangladesh, which will make it possible for the country to use the primary health care as a springboard for the achievement of the universal health coverage. At the same time, there are also substantial gaps in the public health system of the country as well. For instance, Bangladesh has been showing historical, historically very historically very clear trend of underinvestment in health for decades. In terms of the health expenditure as a percentage of GDP, Bangladesh was spending an equivalent to 0.79%. I mentioned 0.79% of, it, of its GDP in health compared with a global average of 5.9%. 99% as of 2014. This ratio, unfortunately, is one of the lowest in the world. And what is worrisome is the fact that between 1995 and 2014, the percentage of the health expenditure vis-a-vis -vis the GDP decreased from 1.2% to 0.79% uh, in the case of Bangladesh, while it increased 
in the world as a whole from 5.29% to 5.99%. As a corollary to this situation, the level of out-of-pocket expenditure uh, in Bangladesh has also historically been very high. Once again, as of 2014, the proportion of out-of-pocket expenditure on health care of Bangladesh was 67% of the total health care expenditure in Bangladesh, as compared with 18%, one eight, 18% 18 for the global average. Most of the out-of-pocket expenditure uh, in Bangladesh is paid for medicines and diagnos uh, diagnostics. This level of out-of-pocket out expenditure can very well be what is called catastrophic health expenditure, pushing particularly poor people deeper into indebtedness and also poverty when they suffer from ill health. We can see, a, we, we could see a glimpse of, uh, of that situation uh, on, in the result of a Liksha Pura survey, which was presented today. This is a very critical point to be considered at a time like the current one. I believe the experiences that we have gone through during COVID-19 COVID pandemic this year and the presentations we saw today clearly justify the need for strong universal health coverage in Bangladesh. Aside from being a basic human rights, which is so important to recognize, the universal health coverage makes sense as a public policy. One statistical analysis based on the data from 153 countries in the world found that broader health coverage generally leads to better access to necessary care and improved population health with the with with largest gains accruing to poorer people. That is, that is exactly what is required in the world, including in Bangladesh. And also this is particularly important. If Bangladesh aspires to grow as a middle-income country in a sustainable manner, Earlier, I mentioned that the health expenditure as a percentage of GDP for Bangladesh in 2014 was 0.79%. In the same year, the average figure for the middle income countries in the world was 3.04% of the GDP, i.e. almost four times as much as Bangladesh. Without enough public investment in sectors like health and education, and by the way, education is another area of underinvestment for Bangladesh. Without proactive you know, investment in these areas, I think there's a very real risk for the country, uh, for Bangladesh, to be caught in so-called middle-income trap. That is stagnation of development after a period of very rapid economic growth. What happened in the course of this year is nothing but tragedy. But if there's any possible silver lining to it, that, that would be for us human beings to learn lessons from this experience and be ready for the future challenges. And I firmly believe that the critical importance of the universal health coverage is one of such important lessons that we must learn from our experiences this year. We should not waste this crisis as it was mentioned in many times, many times during, the, during this webinar. And I really look forward to our close, close collaboration for the realization of the universal health coverage in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tomu. That was uh, very inspiring. And I think the road ahead has been well identified, the need. Uh, I think we have nearly come to the end of this webinar. We have been talking almost for two hours, which is a fairly long time for webinars. But I guess the issue is so important that we have felt the need to continue and uh, make sure that all the voices have been heard. Uh, we have noted in the chat box, uh, even Dr. Shah, Shahdat Hussain, I've been noticing he has been actually uh, trying to also show the data of, from uh, PPRC study and Professor Tahamina study. So 
people have been really engaged in looking at the whole uh, substance of today's discussion. So I want to thank uh, Tomu Huzumi, Dr. Shamsul Alam, who is not here now, all the panelists, uh, the uh, M.M. Nasiruddin and Maya Vendenent for their opening remarks and the PPRC technical team for the support from behind. And want to end on this, uh, on uh, just one or two messages is that it's, uh, I think the, it's very clear that uh, uh, it's like, what Tomu Hazumi just said, strike while the iron is hot. Others have posed it in different manner. Allow, use the crisis as a trigger for a larger action. So I think the, uh, the task to be done is very clearly laid out. The study itself will, you know, it we just presented today the, in a way, at the core of the initial findings, but there will be a full report where we will also integrate the qualitative findings from the uh, truck drivers and the uh, marginalized groups, those also be integrated. I think one issue that uh, should be mentioned here, uh, Mr. Hakim mentioned that, that uh, it's an operational issue. This health card solution, uh, you know, some of the platforms, for example, of the marginalized groups, their own platforms are amenable to be mobilized for this but we found that rickshaw pullers or the truck drivers did not have these collective platforms as much. So the, for them, that it has to be more the uh, systemic solutions, which are uh, which we have to look for. So I think I want to uh, end here that this was a very important one to thank UNICEF for the support. And I think this is a collective uh, uh, effort that we have to, at the end of the day, all these will be meaningful if there is results on the ground. If we have managed to bring down the out-of-pocket expenses, if the rickshaw pullers and the other uh, uh, marginalized groups have improved their access to health, it is not enough even just to make the investment unless those ground reality indicators have really improved. And I think one important message that we need to drive here is that we have to look at uh, changes both at the macro level in terms of uh, overall public investment, but also at the meso level. Uh, for example, the timing of the, uh, the health facilities and uh, several other, you know, the health cards issue, et cetera, et cetera. Those are also, I think, very important. So these process issues are also, I think, critical for us to be able to look for. Innovations are very important. Sometimes we get fixated on a single solution. I think Bangladesh has been focused on a pluralistic way of moving, even for solutions, we may, you know, like even for the urban poor, perhaps the rickshaw puller and truck drivers, for them one type of solution may be more effective, but for those marginalized excluded groups, another type of solution may be more effective. So I think we should not get fixated on a single solution idea, but look at a, like a menu of solutions, each customized for the particular groups but overall, you know, under a uh, certain principles. And we should not also get fixated on this idea of the, the budget as such, because the argument there, I think, has to be about the strategic nature of this uh, enhanced public investment. That is also equally important to be, uh, to be uh, emphasized. Innovations is a very important issue here. There are multiple innovations being tried out, but some of the, what Professor Foy said, our survey actually for us also has raised those questions. Why do a part of the rickshaw pullers try to seek their healthcare in the villages rather than here? That's a question we need to really be able to answer. Why has the COVID infection been reported to be so low here? Is, the, is that an empirical error or is there something else that we need to really look for here? I think those are also issues we really need to uh, try and explore. Last point I'll mention is that we are all realizing that there are important achievements have been made, but there are systemic weaknesses, which my first slide really underscored the systemic weakness. And uh, it's, you know, after everything has been said, 
it is very clear that Bangladesh is a country characterized by low coverage, high financial cost. That is a overall summary picture of Bangladesh's situation that calls for uh, reform of the delivery service delivery models as well as of financing strategies. And here, I think uh, it is important for us also to make sure sometimes the policy audiences may be willing, but if they hear unclear reform ideas, unclear sort of uh, proposals, or sort of a, uh, not a, uh, or, you know, not a uh, consistent set of proposals, then they often do not get energized. So here is a challenge for, I think, the, those who are advocating for reforms to really try and get together those, you know, the, uh, the productive, I would not say consensus, a productive consensus of what, what needs to be done. You know, each of us may have my own uh, pet solution, but at the end of the day, it has to test, pass the test of being uh, uh, accepted around a broader sort of uh, set of actors. And we have to find an appropriate way to transmit this consensus, productive consensus to the poor policymakers. And so I think the three things have to come together the messenger, the message, and the audience to which the message has to be delivered. So the, the messenger in that sense, what I was saying is that a big push is necessary here. I think civic groups, I would urge the civic groups that we should now all get together to try and really strategize on whether a big push civic initiative is called for, not in the distant future, but as a in this pandemic time as a way of the pandemic learnings and the way forward some of us have been discussing the possibility of a citizen health commission on pandemic learnings and way forward as a way to capture the learnings and allow that learning to be really organized in a systematic manner to create that productive consensus and then create a big voice on the national stage so that the appropriate policy audience can take note of this. So those are all uh, ahead. And I hope all of us, all of you who are present today in this webinar will be, uh, I'm sure you will be also, uh, will be co-travelers on this journey. And hopefully uh, at the end of the day, not just the investment, not just the reform proposal to be passed like the urban health strategy but the actual changes in the indicators on the ground, that when that comes to pass, we, we, we can take satisfaction that yes, we have turned a corner and the impact that we are looking for is now happening. On that note, I would like to end the webinar here and thank everyone again for your kind participation. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you.